just as you are to worship God, just as you are before your God, God. sing that again, God, now is the time. we just thank you and praise you for this opportunity to be together in the presence of your people in the presence of your Holy Spirit uh, to worship you in spirit and in truth Father we thank you that you are the God of our journeys that you are the author and the perfecter of our faith 
that you are the God who finishes what you start. Lord, we thank you for the promise that uh, that he who began a good work in us promises to be faithful to complete it. And Lord, for those of us here uh, today that are looking and saying, I have so far to go, thank you that that promise does not come with a qualifier, that you're faithful to complete the work if we're almost done or if we're really close or if we're just on the on the border of being perfected. Oh Lord, you said that you were just faithful to complete whatever it is that you've begun and the good work that you've begun in us by Jesus Christ, by the deposit of the Holy Spirit placed in us. Lord, you're going to see that to fulfill.
Still Church. We are glad that you are here worshiping with us and uh, that you have uh, set this evening aside. And uh, I'm just trusting and praying and hoping that uh, for you sports fanatics that your worship this evening at five o'clock is somehow able to surpass uh, what's going to happen at about eight o'clock tonight as uh, all of our bitterness is once again poured out in sack after sack after sack uh, later on this evening. So 
Uh, not that I'll be watching, but for some of you, that's important to say. Uh, so welcome. We're glad to have you with us. And uh, a couple of really quick announcements. I uh, want to let you know that the uh, chili cook-off is still happening, and uh, I'm hearing rumors of recipes being tried and thrown away and tried and thrown away from lots of corners, except Kevin O'Brien, who's pretty confident because he's won this so many times. Uh, Kevin, are we going with the original recipe here? Can you say? Oh, he's changing it, folks. He's changing it. All right. Trophy's on the line. Uh, you've heard it here. Uh, but just on the 24th after the church service, we're going to just gather downstairs and just enjoy some time of fellowship together and you're here Sunday after Sunday, it might be an opportunity, or if you're watching online, uh, join us on the 24th and, and uh, get to see some people face to face and enjoy some, uh, some great food together. So I'd uh, love to have you there for that. Also want you to keep um, an eye out for the fact that we are going to be having two evenings at the end of October. Uh, they will be Thursday evenings uh, for membership classes. We haven't run this in a while, but um, people have been asking and, and uh, elders are responding. So if you are interested in membership or even just finding out what membership is all about, why, do, why even be a member of a church? Do we have to be a member? Can't we just come and enjoy uh, from a distance type of thing? Um, uh, try that at BJ's next time, by the way. Uh, why do I have to be a member, right? Uh, the church is the one giving up on membership left and right. You know what? Do what you want. Come when you want. But you know what? That's not biblical. That's not what Romans 12 teaches. And so we're going to take these two Thursday nights and just talk about, just for an hour and a half, uh, what does it mean to be a member of the church? What, does it mem what is membership all about? What does it look like? So if you're interested in that, uh, you can just send an email back uh, to Sarah in the office this week. She'll keep a tally of people that are interested in uh, being a part of that, uh, those two evenings. And um, again, if after the second time you meet, it's like, oh, that was very interesting, and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm on my way, that's fine. Uh, we're just going to spend a, those couple of evenings and if you are interested in being a member, that would be uh, your opportunity to take advantage of that. So uh, those two evenings are set aside for that purpose. Let's just uh, join together in a word of prayer as we begin our time in the message. Lord, we just uh, thank you and praise you for the opportunity to just revel in the gospel of Jesus Christ here. To... Um, step away from all of the, the, the busyness and the clamor of this world and just focus in on the fact that we are the redeemed of God Almighty. We are sons and daughters of the living King. We have been set apart for a holy purpose. And Lord, in all of our weakness and frailty and failure, Lord, we bring that all and we lay it at your feet and we say, Lord, with the five loaves and the two fish that is me, multiply bless, use it. Lord, uh, do more than we could even ask or imagine because of your greatness and because of the power of your gospel. Lord, we thank you for this time, and we pray these things all in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bible with you, open to John chapter 15. Big surprise there. John chapter 15. They should automatically just sort of pop open to that uh, uh, that passage of scripture uh, after the last few months of being in John chapter 15, the middle of the upper room discourse of Jesus, preceded by two chapters, followed by two chapters, all having to do with Jesus' final uh, evening together with his disciples before his arrest and ultimately his crucifixion. And we're going to pick this up uh, if you're just joining us for this, uh, this sermon. Uh, forgive me, but we're in priority three of the three priorities of John chapter 15. Uh, but take heart, you can look on the internet and find ch priorities one and priority two, uh, all with uh, three messages each. And this is actually the second message for priority three. So uh, every time I seem to preach on this, it gets a little bit longer. One of these times it's going to just be a year set aside for John 15. But hey, fine with me. I'm going to keep preaching it until I get it, right? That's how this works. John chapter 15, starting in verse 18. This is Jesus speaking, and he says, If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I've chosen you out of the world. That's why the world hates you. Remember the words I spoke to you. No servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. 
they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know, they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. Now, however, they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father as well. If I had not done among them what no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen these miracles, and yet they have hated both me and my father. But this is to fulfill what is written in their law. They hated me without reason. When the counselor comes, whom I will send to you the, from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me, and you also must testify, for you've been with me from the beginning. As I mentioned, we are uh, in a series of sermons from John chapter 15 that uh, I've titled the, the Three Priorities. They were actually introduced to me uh, by a mentor of mine when I was in seminary as uh, a, a, a foundational bedrock teaching that I have held on to uh, ever since then, for the last 20-odd 20, 20 years. Um, the three priorities of uh, abiding in Christ, there in the first uh, eight verses of John chapter 1, as Jesus is saying things like, abide in me and let my word is abide in you. He who remains in me, I will remain in him. Um, the priority of loving one another no greater love has any man that he lay down his life uh, for his friends. And last week we introduced priority three, bearing witness or being a witness to the world around us. The words uh, we so easily associate with our coming into a relationship with God through Jesus, it's quite striking when we get to priority three because what we're used to is words like love, all right? For God so loved the world. Uh, God is love, 1 John. Or peace. This is one of the most famous Christian tracts, probably one of the most widely uh, uh, dispersed Christian tracts. It's called Peace with God. How do we find peace with God? Jesus, one of his titles, one of the messianic titles given to him from the Old Testament was that he would be the prince of peace. Or joy. The joy of the Lord is our strength. These are words that we're familiar with. And we say, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That's, those are the words that we should associate with the gospel. In John chapter 15, however, Jesus introduces a new word that we need to do business with in order to understand and live out this faith of ours. And it's the word hate. Hate. After 17 verses on the importance of abiding in Christ and the fruit of that abiding, which is love, love from God through us to others, his next statement is quite jarring. This literally falls on the heels of his command. This is my command, love one another. If the world hates you, <laughs> he literally turns that quickly. If the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you don't belong to the world. I've chosen you out of the world. And so, um, Jesus seems to, to go on and, and, and basically give a mini-sermon on hate. Honestly, that's what he's doing for the next several verses. And there's good reason for that. Because if you look back to the beginning of John chapter 15, you'll notice something. Jesus uses a tool each time in each one of the three priorities to bring about a bigger and a deeper reality. I'll show you what I mean. He used the parable of the vine and the gardener to bring about the teaching of what it means to abide. In priority two, Jesus used the imagery of the master and the servant to bring about the imagery, or to bring about the deeper point of loving one another. And so here he's about to use the hatred of the world to explain why we need to bear witness to the, that very world. And so tonight, one of the things, uh, what we're going to do here in the message is I'm going to talk to you about three reasons why the world hates you. I know that's a very weird thing to see there on the screen. Uh, it felt weird typing it, but I just can't get around it because that's what Jesus is talking about here in this passage. We need to, do, we need to wrestle with it. As Jesus spent this much time talking about hate, 
uh, we need to spend some time thinking about it and what it is that he's getting across to us. And so I just want to give you from, from, this, uh, from this passage, uh, especially verses 18 through 25, three reasons that Jesus gives as to why the world will hate you. And the first is quite clear. It comes out from the very beginning of this passage. The world will hate you because you don't belong to it anymore. And it's not happy about that. Okay? When you were going along in your sinful ways and you lived in darkness and you never heard or paid attention to the gospel message and you were just living your life apart from God, the world was just fine with you. <laughs> That's why every single day you're like, you know what, all I got to do is figure out how to get along more with the world today and then the world will get along with me. That's how we get phrases like, he who dies with the most toys wins, and just uh, uh, seek to make yourself happy and look out for number one. That's, those are all the mottos of going along with the world. I'm fine, I'm trying to get along with this world, and I'm trying to get this world to get along with me. Until. Until. Look what Jesus, look what Jesus says in verse 19. As it is, you don't belong to the world. I've chosen you out of the world that's why it hates you. Now, this is something that should be, it's worth our contemplation, okay, on a couple of different levels. The first level is, does the world hate you? Do you feel a tension, even an animosity, with the world? And when I talk about the world, I'm literally talking about the rhythms of this natural world the politics and the, the, the relationships and the, uh, the status of things all around us, the status of our country, the status of the things that you see going on, the status of how we are as a society, all of those things, the interactions that you have at work, maybe even the interactions within your own family. Do you not sense the tension? If you don't, you really need to delve into what Jesus is saying here. Because he's saying that there's supposed to be a growing animosity. He uses the word hatred. For the very reason of you have been chosen out of this world. And it has not forgiven you for it. And it doesn't want to let go. It wants to keep grabbing you by the ankles and pulling you back down. That's how it works. If you're not experiencing friction with the world, it's absolutely a good idea to ask yourself why. I mean, I, I know what the, the objections are. Who, hey, listen, who doesn't want to belong? We're hardwired to seek after belonging. Just want to fit in after all. Jesus says, if you belong to the world, it would love you. Followers of Jesus are traitors to this world. There's, uh, for those of you that uh, enjoy uh, the Lord of the Rings uh, trilogy, I don't know if that's any of you, but I'm sure you've seen the movie if you haven't read the books, but the Lord of the Rings, the tension that's throughout all three uh, of those novels, the tension of Frodo and Sam, the two uh, main characters who've gone on a journey, is the tension of them not fitting in their home shire anymore that they go on this journey, that they are brought through all of these circumstances, that they have all of these adventures, that their eyes are opened up to larger purposes and incredible vistas are opened before them, and they're used to do some incredible, powerful things, and all of a sudden their little home village called the Shire <coughs> doesn't quite fit anymore. They love it there. They, love, they have a love in their heart for the Shire, but they've been forever changed by their new experiences. It pained them, yes, it pained them to leave, but now it pained them to stay. The new world opened up for them, so expanded their hearts and minds that the old surroundings became choking. The way that uh, Tim Keller put it in, in a sermon one time was when he was talking about this very thing, he said, the citizenships of their hearts was over the sea. And that's the tension. That speaks to the tension. That's how it's supposed to feel. As a Christian, especially as a new Christian, don't try to make peace with it. That's going to leave you very frustrated and trying to live a double life. 
a, a life rooted in this world and a life rooted in the kingdom of God. It is very frustrating. It is exhausting. It gets you nowhere. Spiritual growth is stunted. It, it, it's misery. Because Jesus is saying, I've chosen you out of the world. Why do you keep trying to make peace with it? I've told you they hate you now. Why are you trying to get them to love you? But I like some of these people. I'm related to some of these people. This is where you have to pull out that verse. When the disciples came to Jesus and said, Jesus, your, uh, your mother and brothers are here. This is where that applies. Jesus said, who are my mother? Who are my brothers? Who are my sisters? They are the ones who are doing the will of my father. Well, that sounds rude. That sounds disrespectful. That doesn't sound right. It's the kingdom reorientation that God is calling each one of us to. You now have a higher allegiance. You now have a higher king. You now face a higher judge than anything this world can throw at you. You've been made different because of your life-changing encounter with him. When you abide in Christ and allow that abiding to spill over into loving others, your former relationship with the world just doesn't fit. Second, second reason the world hates you. You need to expect that the world is going to treat you like it treated Jesus. To abide in Jesus is to become more like Jesus, meaning the world is going to treat you more and more like it treated Jesus. But Jesus says in, in verse 20, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. I mean, you can be disappointed. You can be frustrated. You can even get angry. But you can't be surprised. He told you it was going to happen, right? It's not a secret. Why is this happening to me? I'm a child of God. Well, yeah, Jesus said Jesus said somewhere else in the Gospel of John, I think it's in chapter 6, in this world you will have trouble. Take heart, I've overcome the world. Doesn't take away the first part. You're still going to have trouble. It's still going to be hard. Abiding in Jesus is becoming more like Jesus, meaning the world is going to treat you more and more like it treated him. Jesus is saying here, if you've, you've undergone a shift of allegiance as well, you used to try and draw life out of this world, now you draw life out of the vine. Go back to verse 1 of chapter 15. What explanation does Jesus give for this persecution? Verse 21, very simple. Why? Why would anybody? I mean, you're so nice. Look at you. You're such nice people. No, seriously, look around. I mean, you, I'm, I shouldn't be the only one that sees you. You're all very nice. I know a lot of you. I know that you're nice. Who in the world would persecute somebody as nice as you? Verse 21 tells us, because they don't know the one who sent me, Jesus is talking about. So they're not going to know the one who sent you. Verses 23 and 24, he who hates me, get this, hates my father as well. That means they hate everything that I stand for. If I had not done among them, Jesus said, what no one else did, they wouldn't be guilty of sin. But now they've seen these miracles and yet have hated both me and my father. Can you just step back from the Gospels a second and realize the more Jesus did to bless people, the more hated he became? That's the reality of it. Until, and I hate to say this, but it's the historical reality, some of the most hate-filled people in all of history have been religious leaders. True story. Do the research. The religious leaders lead the mobs in bringing Jesus to crucifixion. Now, don't get me wrong. My sin led him to that cross. Your sin led him to that cross. But it was the, 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 the boiling over led by the religious leaders that said, you know what, we can't even take this anymore. He keeps doing these horrible things like healing people on, on the Sabbath. You can't do it on that day. Pick another day. I mean, Lazarus was on the other side. Leave him there. Don't raise him from the dead. 
this blind man. He was born that way. Just leave him be. All this healing of blind people and feeding of the hungry. Who does he think he is? Let's kill him. Let's kill him. They hated him. So the world despises you in increasing measure, not because they don't really know you, but because they don't really know him. All right, I'm going to say that again. The world despises you in increasing measure, not because they don't really know you. If they just got to know me, they'd see what a great guy I really am. It has nothing to do with you. Or at least it shouldn't. Beware the trap of Samuel. Beware the trap of Samuel. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 8. Samuel was the prophet of God in 1 Samuel, and he anoints Saul as the first king of Israel. And, you know, he's upset that they asked for a king, but they did anyway. And so God's like, fine, I'll give him a king. Take Saul. So he anoints Saul. Saul's the king. And uh, everything's going along swimmingly, you might say, until God rejects Saul as king. Because Saul led the way to his own rejection. Can't go into it. First Samuel, first eight chapters. You'll see what I'm talking about. Samuel comes before God and he says, Oh, these people, God, I can't handle it anymore. They've rejected me. They've rejected me. Samuel, a prophet of God, they've rejected me. <coughs> God has to actually come and speak to his own prophet and say, No, they've not rejected you. They've rejected me get it straight. It feels like they're rejecting you, but they're rejecting me ultimately. Why do you get your own little ego so wrapped up in this? It's not about you ultimately. It's not about your glory. God says it's about mine. And if you could just get your ego out of the way long enough, you'd realize the one they're rejecting is me. It's me. How much credit can you take for the fruit that you bear? And I know this is going back. <clears throat> I don't know if the wheels work in reverse as well as they do in forward, but going back, how much credit can you take for the fruit that you bear? Well, according to the first eight verses of John chapter 15, it's the vine that gives life to the branch, and the branch doesn't push and... Uh, no, by being in that life-giving relationship, it bears fruit, okay? How much credit can you take for the fruit that you bear? None. It's not your glory. It's the gardener's, okay? So in the same way, how much blame can you take for the animosity of the world? None. Because it's not about us. This is what we just can't seem to get past. Third and finally, why does the world hate you? The world hates you, third and finally, because your life is an indictment against it. It's a living, breathing, speaking indictment against the way of the world. Jesus says, the Holy Spirit will testify about me, and you also must speak, testify, use your mouth. Okay? And when you do, it's going to be an indictment against the world. Now, I'm not telling you to go out there and cause trouble. That's not what he's saying. But guess what? You're naturally going to do it. You don't even have to try. You just have to speak his truth. Right? Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. I'm offended. That's offensive. You can't say Jesus is the only way. What about Buddha? What about Allah? What about people in the jungle who have never heard? Now you're saying Jesus is the only way. Whoa, 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 whoa. Again, ego removed. I didn't say it. Jesus said it. I just happen to believe it. I just happen to believe it. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I'm quoting Jesus saying he's the way and the truth and the life. And yes, I believe it. Well, why do you believe it? Because for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes, whoever, won't perish. That's you, my friend. I don't believe it. Okay, now here's what you don't say. It's because you hate him. It's because you hate him. I don't hate God. Well, let's go to John 15 and see. And see what side you're on. 
See, it's not, the world likes to make us think we've got, we got little, you know, fuzzy gray here and fuzzy gray here, and maybe I'm a little bit this and a little bit that, and I've mixed my, you know, religion buffet into this and a little, take a little bit of that on my plate and I put a little bit of this on my plate. God goes, no, you're in the kingdom because of Jesus Christ, sealed by his Holy Spirit, or you're out. That's it. That's it. You're either a, a, a branch that's being pruned to, for greater fruitfulness, or you're being lopped off and thrown out. Jesus doesn't offer the third one. I, I wish he did. I wish he did sometimes. I wish there was that little mushy middle thing that he just kind of made, made a, 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 a way for so we could all go, Phew. man, everybody's going to eventually be all right in the end. It's not the gospel. The way is narrow that leads to life. The way is wide that leads to destruction. That's the gospel. That's what Jesus is talking about. Your life is a living, breathing, speaking indictment against the world. We abide in the vine, and we love one another, and the natural consequence is that we become a witness to and against this world. As one who abides in the vine and loves others, your very presence in the world is a continual reminder to the world that your allegiance is elsewhere. This is a total setup for Acts chapter 1, where Jesus is going to tell his disciples about the coming Holy Spirit. And in both passages, the, the theme is the same. Jesus sends the very Spirit of God to us so that we will be witnesses and bear testimony to the vine. Again, listen to uh, the words of Jesus in Acts chapter 1. When the Counselor comes, he uses the same word as John 15, when the Counselor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. Testify, give testimony, bear witness. Same word. And then what does he say? And you also must testify. For you've been with me from the beginning. You must testify. You must bear witness. You must speak. All right, last note on this section. Listen, if you can't shake uh, the feeling that it's an abrupt change of direction from uh, priorities one and two to, to, to getting to priority three. If you, if you were tracking with the abiding and the loving and you kind of like those messages but can't grasp by why Jesus would uh, allow his talk to take such a seemingly dark turn, uh, this is when, as you, as you read Scripture, it's critical to pause, it's critical to step back and ask, what is the historical moment that this was happening in? Okay? If you're there, you're like, well, you know, why did he go have to start talking about hate? Such a horrible word. I hate the word. Hate. It's awful. We're talking about such great things, being in the vine and being fruitful and greater love as no one than to lay down his life. And we get those things and we like those things and they resonate with us. Why all this talk about hate? Step back and ask, what's the historical moment this was happening in? If you don't do that here, yes, it will certainly take you by storm. But take one giant step back from the three priorities for just one moment. Priority one, be in a close, intimate, abiding relationship with the Father through the Son. A Father who cuts to bring about greater fruit. Priority two, no greater love has anyone than to lay down his life for his friends. So just look at those first two priorities. Priority one, being close, intimate, abiding with the Father, a Father who cuts to bring about greater fruit. Jesus knew he was about to experience that very cutting. It's the night before he was arrested. That's when he spoke these words. Priority two, no greater love has anyone than to lay down his life Jesus was just moments away from the fullest expression of that laying down ever in the history of mankind. Priority three, three, being a faithful witness to a world filled with hate. <laughs> Jesus was just minutes from watching Judas quietly slip away into the night to sell him out. He was about to watch Peter slink away into the darkness to declare three different times that he didn't even know him. 
he was about to feel the full fury of the hatred of mankind through the cracking whips on his own back, through the mockery and through the derision and the thorns jabbing into his skull, and of course the nails pounded through his hands and his feet. And he did all of that in the spirit of priority two. And he did all of that and endured all of that knowing that it was costing him priority one. And everything I just mentioned to you, the nails, the thorns, the beating, the betrayal, make no mistake, it was the breaking of priority one that was the pain of the cross. That intimacy, that oneness between father and son, broken. As the father turns his face, while the full weight of the sin of humanity rested on the son. Jesus had every right. Jesus has every right to call us to live out the three priorities because he lived them. As we conclude our, our time together here this evening, we're going to do so around the elements of the bread and the cup. And they are here uh, in the center of the room on that table. And uh, in just a few moments, I'll, I'll dismiss you to, to just stand up and, and, and go get a, a wafer of bread and a, and a cup. But before we do, I want us to all understand what we're doing as you receive that bread and as you, as you take that cup, it's just not some kind of tradition that we came up with. It's a picture of this very night, of the John 15 night. It's a picture of what happened as Jesus was actually uttering these very words, what was going on at that very table. Jesus, at that very table, took the bread, and, and as he broke it, he was like, listen, this used to mean something in Jewish tradition for over a thousand years. It means something different tonight. That Passover lamb that you've celebrated since you were children is me. I am the lamb broken for you. And that's what this bread symbolizes. And as you, as you take the cup, Jesus took the cup that same night that this dinner was happening, that all these words were being shared. Jesus took that cup, and as he did, he spoke these words to his disciples. He said, this is the cup of the new covenant, my blood poured out for you. And they would have wine with their meal. This is actually grape juice, but uh, looks the same. And the reason why is because they wanted something that would symbolically look like what was happening on that night because as the children of Israel needed to put the blood on the doorposts to show that angel of death to pass over them, so the blood of Christ rests on those who put their faith and trust in him so that the judgment of God passes over us. And that's what that cup symbolizes. And so as we conclude our time uh, together here this evening, we're going to do it around these elements. And I'm, I'm going to pray. And after I pray, uh, you are free to, to just stand. Uh, we're going to close with a couple of songs and... and uh, as we're, doing, as we're doing these songs, you're free to come to the table, um, but I want you to do something first. It's not works, okay? All right, this is, the table is free. It's free and open to all, but Jesus does ask one thing. He says, when you eat the bread and you, and you take the cup, I want you to remember me, and he said something else. He said, when, as often as you do this, you proclaim, you bear witness, you live out the truth of what I've done and keep doing it until I come back. That's why we do this. That's why we do this. So let's just bow our heads uh, in a time of prayer and then um, you will be free to uh, come and take the, the bread and the cup uh, as you feel right. 
Lord God, we thank you for the bread that was broken that evening. We thank you for the bread that speaks of the body that was broken for us. Father, we, we ask that you, Father, would be speaking to us here again tonight about what does it mean for us to abide in you? What does it mean for us to love, truly love like Jesus loved one another? What does it mean for us to bear witness, to proclaim that our life is not our own, that the glory that we used to seek for ourselves is no longer what we're after, that our hearts are reset after your glory, after your praise. So Lord, we receive this bread and we receive this cup in honor of you as a blessing, Lord, that you've poured out into us the salvation that we did not deserve through the broken body of Jesus and through his shed blood. We pray these things in his name. Amen. Yeah. 
Just to say.